Hello everyone, reporting for First Updates Now today, I'm Amos, and with me here, I have Team 9889 Cruise Control from Flanders, New Jersey. They just competed yesterday at the New Jersey Upper League Meet 2 and set a world record of 271 points and the highest OPR currently at around 140 points. Today, we're going to take a deep dive into the robot, talking about their amazing hardware, very consistent software, and how they make sure they're super, super consistent and high scoring in every single match they play. This video on First Updates Now is made possible by viewers like you and also the following sponsors. At Kettering University, over 30% of the student population was in high school robotics. These same students have received a portion of over $7 million in scholarships. Scholarship applications for FIRST students are now available. Get more information at kettering.edu slash FIRST. SOLIDWORKS is free for FIRST teams. Over 80% of U.S. engineering schools and 370,000 plus companies use SOLIDWORKS to design great products. SOLIDWORKS can help you design a great robot on desktop or on the cloud. Go to SOLIDWORKS.com slash FIRST to register your team. Let's get started with your guys' robot. I think the first part that everyone's always interested in is the drivetrain, right? It's the foundation of your robot. It's what makes sure you can do really well every match. So how did you guys go about deciding what type of drivetrain to use this season? Is there anything special you guys want to highlight about your drivetrain? Walk us through it. Yes. Yeah, um, so at the beginning of the season, uh, right as the the game was released, we knew we're going to want a smaller drivetrain uh, similar to last year's Freight Frenzy. So the way the main way that we accomplish this is we use a staggered motor setup. And um, as you can see here, we have our two side motors uh, here and the other two right there. Um, re so this allowed us to have a really compact system for our drivetrain. Um, and it's normal mechanics uh, with uh, chains for the motors. And then we have our three dead wheel odometry pods on the sides. Yeah, I mean, no, that's great. And have you guys made any changes to your drive stream for that this season? Or has it just been something you guys got right on day one and just continued? Um, from the designing standpoint, there was a few changes that we had um, as we uh, had a few months to design the whole robot along with the uh, drivetrain. Mm -hmm. But after actually building it in real life, to stayed the same the entire way through. fantastic and what is your guys's like typical design timeline for the robot as a whole we um prototype um just the different things that we want and then we try to uh have the entire robot CAD by around november so we can start manufacturing any 3d printed or cnc parts that we need to and then uh just start assembling the robot and doing playing drive practice and programming to get the robot to the best that we can by our competitions. Sure, and you know, let's go on to your intake. I think this is something that a lot of teams have had challenges with this year, and it seems like you guys have really hit the nail on the head. Watching you guys drive in matches, you pick up cones with so much ease in your autonomous and your teleop, and I think another thing that's really impressive, I believe in your world record match, I saw you guys stand up a fallen over cone and then proceed to score it so you could get those extra few points. And so walk us through your intake design, any special decisions you guys made or anything that was especially challenging. Yeah, so um, for our intake, we decided to go with a claw. Again, we had uh, come up with a few different things that we prototype with doing something like a um, one of the Vex style with the rubber bands. Um, but which we came to our virtual four bar when we decided to do this, which we'll talk about later. Uh, we kind of knew that because of the space requirements that we had to do a grabber like this. And because our virtual four bar swings over, we knew that it would have to be one that stayed basically in the same position no matter which side the uh, four bar was on. So because of this, we decided to do a top down grabber. And um, to demonstrate, you can see um, we have one servo. We have one uh, servo to power both arms. And the way that this works is we the whole design is basically centered around these two bars. So you can see here that when our grabber is closed, um, these two bars form basically a parallel line to each other. And what this does is it cancels out the force of the bars, which takes all of the load off the servo and means that it's really difficult to open these grabbers when um, when there's a cone in there or when the grabbers uh, close normally. Sure. And, and um, uh, what about when the claws open? Are you guys also locking the servo when it's open or is it just like in uh, just an arbitrary position? Uh, it's just in a normal position okay. uh, for that. Um, 
to go along with the grabber, we have guides um, on both sides of the robot uh, for picking up, which allows it to be very easy to drive into like a cone like on the side and for it to be guided in. Um, and the grabber also does a really good job of helping to pick it up, um, as you can see here, if you want to demonstrate it. Yeah. And then it goes into a, um, just a normal state where the cone is in the center of the robot, which makes it really difficult for like a cone to fall out the bottom. Sure. And have you guys had any like changes to your intake throughout the season, like any developments or something that was really, really helpful in making it just that much more consistent? Yeah. So again, we did a bunch of prototypes with grabbers uh, at the beginning. And then um, for fully manufactured versions of a grabber, I think this is our like fifth full iteration of it. Um, we've gone through uh, many different iterations of especially these fingers here. Uh, we did some where it was more along just the sides. And we came to this design um, using these two PU fingers. And then also a few of the uh, the rubber inside, just making sure to get this the best design that we can. Great. And, you know, you guys briefly mentioned that you have a virtual four bar. I think that's something a lot of teams have been looking at this year because of its ability to maintain uh, the same angle throughout the travel. Were there any special things you want to highlight about your virtual four bar? Anything that makes it different from like a traditional design? Um, so with the virtual four bar is, is um, we have pretty much the entire piece here is um, built around this uh, 3D printed piece for it. Um, and this made it really nice for us because it served as a few functions. One, it was a lot lighter than using like polycarb or metal to build the entire housing. Um, two, it made it really easy to mount our servos down here um, to power the whole thing. And three, it also allowed us to mount the pulleys for the belts directly to this print. Um, so it makes it to be a really simple design that way. Um, and then another thing is we also have a potentiometer right here that's geared to this uh, to the central axle. And this helps us uh, just know the state of where our virtual four bar is um, during the entire match. Yeah, uh, that's fantastic. And I think after your virtual four bar, another thing that teams talk about often is their lift. So how does your lift work? What are you guys using for your slides? And you know what makes it so fast? Yeah, so for our lift, um, we use two sets of Misumi SAR 330s. Um, we have kind of gone off of um, our slides from last year as uh, when we were prototyping, we uh, just needed something to mount our pulleys so that we could prototype the lift. And we had some VEX channel lying around. And we actually found that uh, some teams, you know, will use 3D printed uh, parts to mount their pulleys. But uh, we found with the VEX channel is actually they fit uh, really compactly. And um, they also allow for a lot more uh, mounting holes um, just with how they are. And they basically worked perfectly for what we wanted. Um, and then for our lift, we use uh, down in the bottom of the robot, we use two um, go build uh, 5.2 to 1 motors. And then those are chained to two, two extension uh, spools with strings on either side. And then one retraction spool, which we, you can see the string right there. And those are about two inch diameter spools. Sure. And so you guys mentioned that you use the SAR 330s. So are you guys achieving like full extension with them using strings? Or are, do you guys just not need to use like the full extension of like the three strings? Yes. Yeah. So originally, we were actually going to decide to use the uh, Misumi SAR 340s to get just even more extension out of them. Um, but when putting them in CAD on a robot, we knew that uh, it was too. Uh, we were over the height limit for the robot. So we decided to use the 330s, but we still wanted to use as minimal size as we could. So we did end up uh, using the full extension that you can uh, that the uh, slides have. And the way that we do this is. Um, you can see that the VEX channels here extend out past the Misumi slides themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and that's how we achieve the full extension right. out of the slot. Yeah, that like many of teams, yeah, a lot of teams often talk about like how in order to get the full extension of the three-stage slide, like you need your pulley to be above uh, the top of like where the two-stage slide would be. So yeah. that's really smart. Um, now, I think the next thing we should talk about is your guys' software. It seems like you guys have a lot of sensor integration, and it results in very consistent autonomous programs and teleop automations. So can you guys give a brief overview of like all the sensors on your robot and how you use them? Yeah, so uh, uh, the first sensor I would mention is our camera, uh, which we have. It's a Logitech camera uh, put into a 3D printed case. 
uh, just for better mounting. And uh, currently, it is uh, solely used for detecting the uh, signal. Uh, and we use Easy Open CV for that. Uh, we, we know where the signal should be, and we just look for the average color in it um, to decide uh, which uh, position we need to park in it at the end of auto. Uh, as Alex mentioned earlier, we have three dead wheel odometry uh, wheels, which gives us absolute positioning on the field, uh, which is how we keep our robot uh, accurate in its movements. Um, and then, uh, well, we also have a uh, magnet sensor uh, on the bottom, on the lift here. So when the lift comes all the way down, it'll detect that the lift is there. And that way the lift is not, uh, you know, dragging itself down into the rest of the robot and breaking something. And also whenever the, ro the lift comes all the way down, uh, we can reset the, the encoder on the lift to make sure we always uh, keep an accurate reading. Sure. Uh, because our automation uses the lift encoder to set the position of the lift. And so with that magnet sensor, is it just like the Rev Robotics uh, magnet sensor? Or is it like something else you guys decided to use? No, it's, it's just a Rev uh, magnetic sensor. Fantastic. And I think Alex also mentioned that you guys have a potentiometer on your V4B to keep like accurate tracking. So which servo are you guys using to power your V4B? So for the virtual four bar, um, we just started with using just normal go, uh, go build the torque servos for that. We used two, um, just to get plenty of torque out of this system. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, something that we want to do over uh, the next few weeks is just test maybe other types of servos just to see uh, what's the full potential out of these. But the torque servos is just what we started out, and they have been working pretty well for that. Sure. And are you guys using any, like, distance sensors or light sensors to detect if you have a cone in your grabber or if there's a cone nearby, anything like that? Or do you have any future plans to implement something like that? Yeah. Um, so doing sense types of sensors for that for intaking is something that we want to try to uh, add more of because we don't have any of those right now. Um, so that is something to uh, continue to work on for the robots. Sure. Uh, also, possibly adding in um, some. We have some analog uh, ultrasonic sensors, I believe. I don't remember where they're from, but uh, we would like to, we uh, are thinking about adding them on so we can help detect uh, the wall in autonomous. Great, and I think something that's like equally as impressive as your guys' hardware and software is your driving ability, and I'm sure that's a result of just a ton and ton of driver practice. So do you guys want to talk a little bit about that, like if you guys have any strategy like while you're practicing or if you take notes or, you know, how you make sure you maintain consistency from practice to matches? So while we practice, uh, we try to add as many, uh, you know, unusual factors as we can to, to keep us prepared because uh, once we get to a real match, we're going to have three other robots on the field as well. So uh, the simplest way is just throwing some like toolboxes on the field, just cutting off certain areas. Uh, in the past, we've had uh, extra drive trains as well, and then have some of our other team members uh, drive those around the field. Uh, and we're still working on getting a, a couple of drive trains uh, operational for this year. Yeah, that's fantastic. And so correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe your next competition is like late January, January 21st or so. And looking at your ranking, you're currently ranked second in your league. And that's just because of your uh, TBP one. So you, your average auto score. So do you guys have plans? Like what's your plan to raise that auto score to the next level and come out on top in your league? So some of uh, six, no, I think it's five of our scores in TB one are from our first meet which was only a one plus two auto. So hopefully at our next meet, we'll be able to replace a lot of those with uh, one plus fives uh, that we showcased in um, our previous meet. Uh, but also in our previous meet, we had some consistency issues. Uh, one problem was uh, driving. We used a wall to help us line up on the cone stack, uh, but the wall doesn't always stay rigid. Sometimes it moves on us, uh, which causes our auto to fail or to uh, drive too far or whatever. Uh, and that's why earlier I mentioned that we want to use ultrasonic sensors. Yeah. Um, another idea would be to use uh, possibly a sensor uh, to detect the cone stack to help us uh, make sure we're actually grabbing it and speeding up certain areas so then we can slow down in other spots like picking up. We are we start uh, the virtual four bar starts coming in as the lift is uh, picking the cone off the stack, uh, which means that we actually end up uh, pulling the stack a little bit. And I believe in one of the matches, we ended up knocking over our tower because of it. So just a couple of things that we need to uh, slow down a little bit just so that it's more consistent. No, I mean, that's great. It sounds like you guys have a really good plan of what you want to do, and I think you guys have provided an excellent, uh, detailed 
uh, overview of your robot and how it works. So Cruise Control, thank you very, very much. I'm sure people are looking forward to see how you perform on the fun top 25 and throughout the rest of the season. So I think that'll wrap up our interview. Reporting for First Updates Now, I'm Abbas. This video on First Updates Now is made possible by viewers like you and also the following sponsors. This video on First Updates Now is made possible by viewers like you and also the following sponsors. SOLIDWORKS is free for FIRST teams. Over 80% of US engineering schools and 370,000 plus companies use SOLIDWORKS to design great products. SOLIDWORKS can help you design a great robot on desktop or on the cloud. Go to SOLIDWORKS.com slash FIRST to register your team. At Kettering University, over 30% of the student population was in high school robotics. These same students have received a portion of over $7 million in scholarships. Scholarship applications for FIRST students are now available. Get more information at Kettering.edu slash FIRST. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring the bell to stay up to date on our new videos. Keep the conversation going and provide your input to our content. Watch our live shows at twitch.tv forward slash first updates now. Join our Discord at discord.gd forward slash first updates now and check out Fun FTC on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and First Updates Now on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter.